All right, Chris, we're live. Welcome to the show, man. Great to have you here. Yeah, thanks, AJ. Happy to be here. So, Chris, tell the audience a little bit about your background, uh, both as an outdoor lover, uh, but also kind of your professional background that led you to, you know, wanting to start your own physical product company. Yeah, I grew up in the Bay Area in California, which is just an amazing uh, ecosystem, Mediterranean climate. Um, and I've been steeped in the outdoors my whole life with my family, taking trips to Tahoe and um, growing up mountain biking and skiing and uh, hiking, camping. I was a Boy Scout as well. Um, when I was in high school, I uh, got a job in a bike shop when I was 15 and just loved it. It really just clicked. Um, and I realized that I was good at selling bikes, good at talking about bikes, loved the people I worked with. And, um, you know, when I went off to college, I realized, hey, I'm, I'm good at selling stuff. And I asked my mom, how can I make the most money selling stuff? And ended up studying finance and doing these internships that were really kind of dry in the financial world. And just realized, like, putting on a suit and tie and just pounding cups of coffee and making phone calls every day wasn't really my thing. Um, Midway through college, I actually got an internship at Poor Boys Productions, which is a ski movie production house. I really looked up to those guys. I was working for free, and I was like, this is the best internship I've ever had. I love being connected to this outdoor industry and, and feeling like I'm in it. Um, and, and that really kind of paved the way for me to understand that I think I wanted to work in the outdoor industry. Um, they're just my people, and I would love what, what we were doing. So... Um, coincidentally, a friend who I grew up skiing with, um, he was four years older than me, an engineer at UC Davis, and he had, he had started a, uh, a little Bluetooth speaker company really early on, early when people didn't know what Bluetooth was. And I was kind of like got a little campus rep team together, thought it was really fun. And when I graduated school, um, I worked for a bit in LA, but then ended up moving into San Francisco into this loft in San Francisco. And we worked together to build this brand, which was making ultra portable, wearable speakers um, for outdoor athletics, mainly cycling without headphones. Um, and that experience was pretty eye opening. I joined and I thought, all right, I can sell these speakers. I'll do my best to sell them. And as I was selling these speakers and meeting people, they had a pretty funny design, the first one. Um, people loved our brand. They loved the fact that it was Bluetooth, an alternative to headphones for cycling. Um, they're colorful. They were loud. There was this magical little thing. But at the end of the day, they wouldn't buy it. And I kind of thought, well, it seems like we have everything there. But if the product looked maybe a little bit different, a little more sleek, uh, maybe people would buy more of that. So kind of set off on this little skunk works or a little startup. And I started designing like this speaker that I thought would be a really cool thing to sell and made some prototypes with our factory and ended up finding something we liked. We did a cool Kickstarter campaign. That thing blew through our goal really quickly. Um, it was this big whirlwind. And when it came time for me to get back to selling them, we had raised venture money. And they're like, you're not the sales, you're the product guy. Like, you got to go keep making this stuff. And, and that's really when my career shifted into product. That's awesome. You know, it's funny. Uh, my very first job was at a bike shop when I was 15 years old. Uh, and oh, wow. it was such a great experience for me because I started out stocking shelves and then I got to work as like a mechanic building, you know, some really basic BMX bikes and then some mountain bikes. And eventually I ended up getting to sell some product on the floor. And I learned so many things in that job. One of the things that I always share with young people today, I think one of the most valuable lessons I took away from that job <clears throat> was when I didn't have anything to do and I needed to go find something to do. If I asked the general manager, Dirk, Dirk would give me these like great projects to work on. He'd be like, oh, go build this road bike or, you know, go learn about this product. But if I went to the owner the owner was like, go clean the stock room, like go clean the bathroom. Like, and, and so it really taught me 
to, to understand who in the business is going to give you opportunities, right? Because different people are going to have different ideas of who you are within the company. And the general manager, Dirk, gave me like all these great opportunities. Dirk and I are still good friends today. He's got a great bike shop in St. Louis. Shout out Billy Goat Bicycles. Uh, and it was just a really great experience. So it's really cool to hear that that's how you got started you know, now you're running an optics company. You make really high quality, fun, colorful, portable, durable optics, right? Binoculars and monoculars. How did that come about? You know, you were, you were working in, in speakers. What was the transition uh, or what kind of gave you the idea to start an optics company? Because I think so many of us outdoors people find some gap that we think needs to be, you know, filled, whether it's a product or whether it's a service or whatever, very few of us have the guts to go out and actually do it and then produce a really high quality product like you have. W what got that started? Well, I think there's a few things um, from kind of a macro level. That experience at Boombotics was really awesome because we were a small company. I joined as a co-founder got to see kind of the whole, we got to take the whole business uh, journey. And from my perspective, being in product, I noticed like that felt like the highest leverage thing you could do as a brand. Getting a, a social post from some big person, it's a little blip or a, a press hit, it's a little blip, but building product that is meaningful and, and has kind of that, that appeal, I think was really just eye-opening to understand like that really worked. We did a lot of other things, but there's like a few big things, big levers to pull. And so that also just compared on, combined with knowing how to make product um, at scale. I probably took 20 trips to China. I lived out in Asia actually during those boombotics days. And um, I just learned how to, how factories work and how to understand capacity planning, development with factories. I mean, I think I spent over a year of my life in Asia by the time I was 27. Wow. Um, so I really, and I, it's a great culture and it is just fascinating when you show up in like Shenzhen and you see this malls full of little semiconductors and like, it is just such a, a manufacturing powerhouse. It really is. And you kind of have to see it. So anyhow, Boombotics was great experience. We also, I think a big learning was just in raising venture capital. They really, you know, they're not concerned about building airplanes. I like to say that we built a great airplane, a business that had customers. It was cool. It was durable. And the board really was like, well, take it to the moon. And I'm like, we can't take it to the moon. It's an airplane. We don't have you know, the, the right tiles in the thing. Like, it doesn't matter. Take it to the moon because from their perspective, you need these outsized returns from portfolio companies or who cares? So we worked with some really cool artists. We worked with Wu-Tang, Grateful Dead, developed a product line, had a lot of wide distribution, but ultimately in trying to grow that distribution, we took it to the moon, we hit the atmosphere and the airplane totally blew up because airplanes are not meant to fly into space. So it was a humbling experience. And after that, I was sitting at home. I built a 3D printer um, and was kind of noodling around on just some other ideas, understanding this. Like, I think my understanding was I have this good connection with brand and why people buy things through brands and then how to make products and was considering stuff in the dental space and was prototyping flossers and toothbrushes when a roommate of mine, a good friend, came back from outside lands and was like, man, if only we had cool binoculars, like that would have really increased that experience. And, and it got the wheels turning of just like, huh, binoculars. Yeah. There aren't really any cool binoculars. And we bought some and we started using them and you know, they were a very handy tool. They were fun. We could check the surf with them. We could uh, go to the, um, we could check the surf, look at our raccoon friends. We could look at um, the birds in the backyard, like, all sorts of fun, um, fun things to do with it. And I realized that there wasn't really that brand that was talking to me. These brands were out there saying, how many birds can you see? How big of a rack can you take? And, and ultimately in that period of research, just thought, wow, there, there might be something here. So, um, 
with a 3D printer, kind of just got designing and, and prototyping. Yeah. And I think one of the things that really took me about Knox Provisions or, you know, really made me notice the brand. My wife and I travel all over the place in an RV and we go to all kinds of outdoor outfitters and great little boutique shops in the towns that we visit. And I started seeing your binoculars in stores left and right. And they are in really fun, creative colors. The texture is very different than any other pair of binoculars or monocular that I've ever seen. It's got, I think it's kind of a, a kind of a wave slash sand dune kind of a inspiration. It's got this really great texture to it, which not only provides really great design, but also I would imagine has a, a real kind of um, tactile component to it in helping you hold them feeling great in the hand. Uh, you know, I've been around binoculars my whole life, as I've shared with you before. Uh, both of my, you know, my father-in-law and my father use binoculars on a daily basis. My my father-in-law is an avid bird watcher. He, you know, uh, monitors bald eagles for the Missouri Department of Conservation and documents birds in his backyard for ornithog ornithological studies. Uh, and mm -hmm. then my father, who was born with macular degeneration and has some vision problems, has really used binoculars as part of, you know, being able to watch me play sports growing up, working on jobs as a contractor from distances away when he's looking at projects. And then as a sailor in his retired life, they've played a huge role in navigation and in checking out coastlines and other ships, you know, figuring out where ships are on different bearings and things like that. So binoculars play like a really critical role in a number of my family's lives, but they've always pretty much looked the same. They've all been the same for the most part since I was a little kid all the way up to, you know, 40 years old now. So to see someone innovate with colors and textures and the style, it really kind of caught my eye. Uh, and I started noticing them everywhere that we went. And you've really had, you know, great, uh, for lack of a t better term, penetration into the market. You're, you're featured in, I want to say, hotels and sporting arenas. And, and as you've shared with me, kind of where your customers are, right? You want to meet your customers where they are. Uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, you touched a little bit out on, on having that experience with VCs in the past. You've really kind of grown this brand pretty organically uh, so that you don't have those pressures and you can really just deliver for your customers. Is, is that a fair kind of summary? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, that's a fair summary. And I think I want to touch on a few things as well on that sense of the design. Um, it was, it was this idea of, Hey, like there, the binocular world looks very homogenous. They're, you know, very tactical looking. It is a military kind of instrument originally. Um, and so this idea of how do we make something that's different? And I think that does start with the product design, the brand. And actually, it was really cool to have a 3D printer. Actually, I have a 3D print right here of some of the original kind of samples that we made. Um, nice. And just this idea of how do you do something totally different? And it was interesting because as an industrial designer by hobby, um, having designed these speakers, I kind of had this feeling after the business, the boombotics thing had ended of like, are you really a designer? Can you prove to yourself that you can actually like keep this going? Was that just like some stroke of luck and you're going to go back to like a sales career? Like, or are you really a designer? So I really spent a lot of time thinking about the concept, looking at inspiration from BMX grips to Frank Stella art to the sand dunes and the beach and and set out to try to make something that was a really unique kind of aesthetic and design. I probably printed 20 different sh different original concepts um, and really refined down to what we have now as that baseline and kind of our brand design language. And so that took a, that took a while and it was a super fulfilling design project. And, you know, looking back, it really was just making a colorful binocular. We wouldn't be here today. It's much more than that. It's obviously, it's the brand. It's this thoughtful attention to detail and the product and the packaging. And, you know, that after doing Boombotics and raising money, you kind of just chased a bunch of things and you threw people at projects and you just, it was a bit out of control. And I realized that 
with with Knox, it was pretty humbling after Boombotics as well. And so to focus on like, let's just make the best branding possible. Let's make the best product possible. Let's make the best best packaging. I kind of looked at just like, what are the minimum elements to get this thing going so we can know if there's actually traction? Because if there's not traction, I'm not going to, I'm no longer a passionate entrepreneur, you could say, as in, oh, I'm going to make this thing and it's not going to have product market fit and I'm going to toil on it for 10 years and barely, you know, no way. I'm going to go to work for someone else. Like, so with Knox, it was building out those minimum touch points really mindfully and then testing to see, all right, can we put ads on Instagram and how, how, how will it do? Is if we spend more money, will we continue to grow this thing? And that was kind of the original hypothesis. Um, I brought on a business partner, co-founder pretty early on in who really was as deep in finance and operations experience to help with that scaling. Um, and ultimately, you know, when you look at companies that do have this kind of like, you know, you could call it a uh, lightning in a bottle and they raise a ton of money before they've established like what they actually need to do, you end up with this kind of bloat and chasing in a million different directions and trying to hit revenue numbers. And you end up skimping on product. You end up rushing things to market. You end up diving into channels that aren't aligned with the brand. You end up not being able to like worry about a philanthropic kind of give back side of the business because you're just jamming product and people and processes through. And so the way that we built this, I'd say is mindfully is a great way to do it, but it really was just around what's the, what do we have to do in order to maintain the brand and, and pre the brand and product presence that we want. And so between myself and David, we had really built out every function of the organization and ran them. So from marketing, from asset creation, our naturalist program, our ads to adding on wholesale when we reached that point you know we were originally just dtc only we found enough shops and reps who were like hey we we want to work with you guys and we didn't just say oh uh yeah for sure we'll we'll send you stuff we're like ooh we need to build that process out so we designed like a special backdoor for shopify and a, a little crm and you know finally when we were ready to launch wholesale we did but we've just kind of had a mindful simple business and really have understood all the functions. And as we've grown, I kind of say we like have worked till we broke ourselves in marketing and operations. And so we hired a marketing manager and an operations manager. And we're like, here's your playbook. This is what, this is what we're doing. This is how we're growing. These are our people. These are our processes. And um, we've done the same thing for sales as well. And this year we added a head of product um, and, you know, we're not adding people saying, oh, my gosh, what, what do we do? We're like, hey, we've worked, you know, burned both ends of the, the fuse on our product organization. Here are our factories. Here are the designers. Like, this is kind of how we work. And I think from a founder's perspective, it's just allowed us to understand everything that's going on, know why stuff is happening. There isn't the, like, hire some you know, super experienced and Fortune 500 company CMO who's coming in and saying, you need to do this. We've been really methodical around what we do. And, and then backing that up with data and testing, like, this is working, this is not working, and, and understanding everything about the business and really just maintaining simplicity as a core pillar. Um, and it's allowed us to grow and but not grow in a way where we add, you know, thousands of different stores and we realize that the product looks horrible and we can't service them and we just need to keep throwing money at problems. Um, it's been a pretty interesting contrast to raising VC, spending that money, trying to hit their growth goals and really operating on a uh, runway basis, as in you're going to run out of money in eight months. And you need to go back to the pot and raise more and spend all of your time doing that versus more on a cash flow basis, which is saying, hey, for this fall, we want to ship these products against these forecasts. And we need to find a way to kind of make that happen through cash flow. 
You know, you you said three things in that, you know, kind of summary there, which I want to kind of revisit and we'll do them in order. You, you talked about, you know, an importance of being philanthropic and giving back to your community. So let's start there. But I also want to touch on, you know, the packaging side of things and then your naturalist ambassador program, because I think that feedback loop of having a bunch of folks that are passionate about your product that can give you, you know, their feedback is important. But let's talk about your dedication to being philanthropic, giving back to your community? Why is that so important to to you and to the brand, to Knox? Well, you know, there's a few factors there. And, and from the very beginning, when my friends knew I was starting this business, it, you know, in San Francisco, living by the coast, of course, a give back component is really important to any brand today that starts. I mean, any brand, if you're not doing something on that aspect, um, it's just missing kind of the modern take on why people I think are going to resonate with a new brand. Um, and so we had friends who were saying like, Hey, you know, we got to do save the waves. Like let's, let's work on that beach cleanups. And I have, I really respect that. And a lot of brands that I know are really active in that kind of conservation side of the business. And I luckily with that product design, had a lot of time to think about this um, before launching and one thing that really resonated was this, this fact that I've kind of raised this question of for who? So save the waves, like for who? For people who know how to surf? Well, who are people who know how to surf? They're pretty like, they're probably pretty well, you know, equipped in the outdoors. They probably have a lot of sort of privilege and access. And, um, and that's nice to keep waves to clean up beaches. And, but I did think a lot about who. And when you look at living in a city like San Francisco, there are people who live in part of the city who've never been to Golden Gate Park just because their family, their culture, their dual working parents, not a lot of access, not a lot of resources, not a lot of understanding. Kind of in, in my mind, it's like I personally spend time in nature for mental health, for grounding, for able to cope with the stress and the day to day of just doing what we do. And, um, and I thought that that was really just important, um, to help create access for people who, from communities who typically don't have access to nature because of the mental health benefits. And because of some, you know, once you do realize your, pre your place in this natural world that we live in, maybe we will make better decisions and recycle more or choose, you know, to not do things that are sort of bad for the earth. Um, and so that was the original hypothesis and that was who we supported. So trips for kids Marin was this organization every two weeks, they load up a, you know, van full of kids from the mission, go out to Golden Gate Park, set them up with mountain bikes and like rip through the trails in Golden Gate Park and stop at these beautiful vistas. And I would volunteer with those guys. And then for the 1% of the planet, structuring, which we added 1% of the planet as a way to kind of create that um, uh, discipline, right? Like there's companies that love to start when their revenue is in the, you know, maybe a hundred thousand, they say, oh my God, we need to, 1% is nothing. We need to give back like 4% for blah, blah, blah. And it's their own program and it works until you go three years down the road and you reach some speed bumps and your cash flow isn't there. And you're like, I don't know if we're going to do that. 1% of the planet is a great organization because in order to wear that badge, you need to, there's accountability on their end. And so we worked with this start. We worked with trips for kids Marin through 1% of the planet since launch. And that was just a great way to kind of frame what we're about, which is supporting organizations that are out there doing the work that are getting people from underserved communities into nature. And since we've worked with a lot of different groups, the Feminist Bird Club, the BIPOC Bird Club of Wisconsin, In Color Bird Club, Intersectionalist Environmentalist. Um, there are, I should have prepared a list for this, but we've kind of structured our financial support to organizations that fall under that umbrella. And on the flip side of that coin, we're out here making products. And I think from a consumer perspective, you don't see it. You see the packaging. Cool. From a, working in a retailer, yeah, you see product boxes come in. But from a brand, I mean, you go to the warehouse and you're like, those pallets, that's, wow, that's a lot of stuff. And when you see 
returned products at Boombotics, we had a lot of RMA, like warranty issues. And you see like a full pallet of junk and you look at it and it's like, I did that. That was, I designed all that stuff. And now that's like waste. Dang. So in creating a product like binoculars, there's sort of this idea of creating a long lasting durable product. Um, and so from a sustainability perspective, I actually have the original prototype box sitting here on my desk that I just cut out on the kitchen table, you know, with some other box that was laying around. But there were a few aspects to that. Um, I'll break down all three. One was plastic-free packaging. And I, I kind of just think it's funny how simple it is and how of a much of a no-brainer that is as a new brand. Like, if you're a brand in an outdoor space and you're shipping plastic poly bags, you're just saying, okay, well, that's how the factory does it. It's incredible how mindless that is because one poly bag to a customer, who cares? You pick up your dog poop with it. But when you create thousands of products, that's a lot of just waste that goes straight into the garbage. I mean, it serves no purpose at all. And um, so plastic free packaging, no, it was like no brainer. Of course, like you're, we're an outdoor brand. How could you mindlessly do anything but this? So that was one piece. Um, the other piece was really around product design and durability. And I think this is starting to make its way into the sustainability conversation. It's not about making like, if you, if you can make something out of fully recycled or upcycled materials, that's awesome. If it falls apart in six months, that's not awesome because you still created waste. And so from the beginning with Knox, a huge emphasis was placed on the, the sort of, um, durability of the product and the durability of the product means that we want to create stuff that can last for generations. And if you're going to spend that energy to create something once and ship it across the ocean and ship it to an end consumer, we want that thing to hold up. And we're really proud. I mean, five years in right now, our warranty defect rate is like, it's less than a quarter of a percent. It is incredibly low. And most of those warranty defects are from people like if you're dropping the product or <laughs> we had a lot of issues with dogs chewing on these things. <laughs> um, <laughs> so for the most part, the, the product durability and lifespan has been a big focus. And I think that that's kind of going to make its way further and further into that kind of zeitgeist of sustainability discussion. And then since we started shipping into wholesale, we've carefully measured all of our carbon emissions and we offset those carbon emissions. That's a touchy conversation because there are people who say, well, I'm offset my emissions. I'm, I'm carbon free. Look at this. I fly my private jet around, but I am not cutting down this one rainforest in Ecuador. It's like, right. I don't think those, those things don't really weigh out. And that's kind of on the modern edge of sustainability discussion, claiming that you're carbon neutral. Like, you know, we're going through that learning process ourselves, but we're doing our best to measure our carbon emissions and one, reduce those emissions. So cutting out air freight, we've done that. We have multiple warehouses in the US to lower the transit emissions to those end customers. Um, we're continuing to innovate and use recycled materials in our product and then focusing on that product lifespan as well. And then for the carbon that we do create, uh, we work with organizations that are like sea trees that are actually going out and planting, planting trees, um, helping sustain the ocean ecosystem in a way for us to measure and kind of try to, um, try to not, I wouldn't say offset is the right word, but try to support the environment in a way that's measured and connected to the amount of, uh, CO2 emissions that we put out. That's awesome. And Chris, you know, I, I think that, Having that real kind of holistic approach to it, right, and thinking about it, I love the term for who. I'm stealing that, by the way. Uh, I'm going to start mm -hmm. using that for the organization. I work for a nonprofit uh, kind of as my day job, and, and we're going to start talking about for who a lot more. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, one of the things that I really wanted to talk about was your naturalist ambassadors, right? Because I think that feedback loop of having hundreds of individuals that are out there using your product, being an ambassador, sharing it with the world, but also I would imagine giving you guys 
a lot of feedback on, you know, what is working, what may not be working, what they'd love to see in the future. How did you decide to build that program? And you and I talked briefly. I was really impressed by the fact that you chose the word naturalist uh, as, you know, your, your community of really passionate followers. Uh, how did you come to to that and how have you built that program in a way that it's been useful to not only your customers, but to you as a business? Well, um, the naturalist program has been one of the coolest things that we do as a brand. Um, ultimately, in building a brand, you have to talk about things. Um, and we, you know, in a sense, people love to see other people with the product. I mean, if you look at any other outdoor brands, they've got their athlete teams, that's who they're talking about. And for us, we're not about like massive bird count or like how many bucks can you bag and sponsoring the biggest hunter or something. Um, we're out, you know, I think celebrating the normal, celebrating the real people who are out there doing the thing. Um, and and I think from a brand perspective, from like a marketing perspective, that type of thing, just from a business side, it's really interesting to see real people using the product um, in a real like natural way. Um, I always, the original idea was just like, I just want to see how someone actually goes out when they wake up and they go out birding um, or if they go out for a hike, like not some big overproduced dramatic climb to the top of the mountain, but just like, Hey, just go out and shoot some photos when you're just doing something on your normal, like hike. Um, the naturalist program has been great because it's a system in a sense where we we're not going out and trying to reinvent. What do we do this month? We're like, we have this sort of, um, community that we love to support and switching gears as a brand today, you're talking about something. And for us, in conjunction with that for who the naturalist program is a way for us to really celebrate the, the real like broad, diverse people who use binoculars and are naturalists um, and really celebrate them as a brand. We have this platform and, you know, to show to our community people that might look like themselves saying, Hey, like they're birding or the outdoor space. Isn't just this whitewashed space it has always been it's always been a space where there's been diverse participation from black indigenous people of color they've always been out there doing it and yeah. these brands i want to call it laziness you know it's like they have their friends and they talk to their friends and people in their network and so for us it was a bit of a reach to go out and forge some of these relationships but as a brand as a platform if we can show these these people, this diverse group of people, how they use binoculars and not just say, Hey, can you send us photos? It's like, we want with our naturalist program, it's an interview. We want to hear about, you know, what their relationship is with, with, uh, like, um, public outdoor spaces, their experience, their thoughts around the outdoor industry, what it's like to be participating in it and really sharing this depth to show that it's not just, Oh, you guys hired a diverse set of models, but actually saying like, Hey, we've gone out, we forged these relationships. We really care about our naturalist team. We really care about what they have to say. And we want to use the Knox brand as a platform for them to be able to communicate with a larger audience. Um, and, and as a platform, as a brand, we want to show that the outdoors is for everyone. We want to show that this isn't just another whitewashed outdoor brand. And I think that having that rooting in that for who supporting organizations that are helping create access for people who don't typically have outdoor access by showing those spaces, not just as like general models, but by giving full interviews and really trying to show that go explore the depths and their history of outdoor participation to really help. I don't know if the word is normalized, but to show that this is a space for everyone, it always has been, and that it's easy for me to say as a as a white man, but that people should feel like the outdoors is for everyone and you can participate in, in nature. Um, 
and a big thing with binoculars too, it's this concept of you don't need to be, you don't need some crazy kit and mountain bike or all of this overhead costs, really, if a pair, not even a pair of binoculars, just if we can get people off the couch and out into their backyard, that is a big win. And that's kind of where we want to be is in that showing how, you know, simple it is to go out and bird just in your backyard. Um, rather than putting out content of like, climb to the top of the biggest mountain and, right. you know, pose up there. It's like, no, no, just, just try to capture your day and a day in the life, a normal thing. So yeah, that yeah. was a long winded approach, but we, we love the naturalist program and, you know, want to continue uh, as far as a brand goes. That's something that's like, we're going to continue supporting organizations that are doing the work and we're going to continue working with naturalists and kind of working on with the people that we've worked with, continuing to invest there as well as kind of growing that, that um, unofficial team of naturalists. Yeah, I can tell you, uh, my father-in-law, Doug, one of the things, you know, as I've talked about earlier is, you know, part of a, a data capturing group that, you know, s contributes to Cornell's, you know, national ornithological, ornithological study. And Doug will literally go from his living room to a door by his dining room that is, you know, just a big glass door. And he's got an old school clipboard that he sits there with and a, and a pen and just sits there and stares out his back door documents all the birds that he sees for about an hour a day, just kind of tracking when birds are in the area and then submits that data. It's not like he's going on these huge adventures across the country. He's not traveling to other countries to do it. He's literally just doing it right in his backyard. So 100% yeah. understand where you're coming from. That makes all the sense in the world to me. And, you know, it is one thing to build a brand that's got a great logo and a great message and speaks to diversity and sustainability. It's another thing to build a product that is really well received and quite frankly, wins awards. You guys were voted best binoculars for bird watchers by this little publication that most people have probably heard of called National Geographic. Uh, no yeah. small feat. How did that feel when you guys were given that award? What did that mean to you? What did that mean to the brand? Uh, and how did that kind of reinforce what you're doing? Well, um, as a product driven organization, uh, we have kind of a little unofficial mantra of build products, build five star products. Like every product we make, we want to get a five star review from our customers. Um, and that helps us narrow the focus and not just look at, you know, some of our competitors have like these huge skew portfolios. And for us, um, we've built products to this point really intuitively. Um, we started with our standard issue compact binocular. And really that was an overlooked category because our big competitors, they're out there making binoculars for birders, for hunters, high performance. They're getting all their margin from these big $300 products. And we just knew... We, we want something compact, easy to travel with, 100 bucks. That's the idea. And got out the gate with that. And we were not speaking to birders. We were not speaking to hunters. Um, we created a monocular just because monoculars are really cool. And Yeah, um, yeah they are. Know, a lot of people were like, you guys should make a monocular and kind of explored that idea. Made a monocular to kind of have like a little family. But then in that process, especially in 2020, when we had that Christian Cooper incident in New York City, and there were a lot of birders who saw the Knox brand and realized like, hey, we don't want to be working with this brand that's out there tabling at the NRA convention. We don't want to be, we want to work with a brand that's like, that kind of fundamentally is, is rooted in um, kind of this new school train of thought. Um and all of a sudden we had birders using our product and we went, man, we got to make something for them. Like we need to show up in this world. So we made a full size birding eight by 42, 10 by 42 binocular, which was like the antithesis of what, what year, two years before I was like, we'll never make that. And it was right. like, Oh, well actually we need to make one and it has to be really high quality. And we made a leap to a $300 price point just because we wanted to make the best product possible, not just check that box. It, may, it probably would have made sense to make it at 150 bucks to compete with the uh, Nikon Pro Staffs, but we wanted to make something that we really loved and that we knew our, our people would, would love. And then following that, 
there was just this gap in making this sort of mid-size, we call it the Goldilocks binocular. So taking like the lens coatings and the prism coatings from our pro issue, but putting them back into a little bit smaller form factor, still having that oversized focus wheel, but that compact DNA in the product. It was just, to me, I was like, that we, we got to make that good, better, best, easy. Um, and we shipped the product and, you know, we're not out here doing Kickstarters and huge launch campaigns and just trying to pray that everything we make just hits. Um, we launched that thing in April of 2022 or 2023. And, um, you know, it had been out there and it's long-term testing. And so to see in March of 2023, receiving that award really mean a lot. Because it wasn't like we fed it into, you know, a pipeline for launch. It was, I think that feeling was just like, cool, we're on the right track. Um, and so, yeah, yeah that, yeah. And, and I think that we're going to, it, it wasn't like we designed it for some sort of award seeking. It's really just building good product. And um, that was really validating. Speaking of that, and Chris, let's wrap up with this. Uh, I'm sure you've had some stories from customers, from friends, from retailers that have kind of reminded you that we're on the right track, that we're connecting with the right kind of, you know, people, the, the hour for who, and that they're really enjoying what we're doing and the way that we're doing it. Uh, if you have a story or two that you would share about, you know, kind of things that have, have made you go like, all right, we're doing this right. We're really, uh, we're hitting the goals that we wanted to hit, not necessarily from like a revenue standpoint, but from just a, you know, a product design and implementation standpoint, you know, what have been some of those aha moments that have really reminded you we're on the right track? Um, you know, I think we, in tandem of supporting organizations financially, we do donate a lot of product to organizations. Um, we also make our product available to schools and parks. Um, there's a lot of really cool grassroots organizations and we really love to empower the front line and the grassroots orgs that are, that are doing things. We, we talk to everyone who's going to write us a note. Um, and so whether it be a donation of say 20 or 40 binoculars to a birding group, that is a grassroots sort of people who didn't find their place with Autobahn, seeing their people that they're leading use the product, creating these experiences and where everyone has like a good pair of binoculars and they're not having to share and use kind of cheap stuff. We're, we're really happy to see that. I think that really just um, to be able to provide these tools is really important. Um, there was a customer who wrote us who was saying that their, her husband was someone who was, had some pretty severe physical disabilities and really wasn't able to leave the house. But with their pair of standard issue binoculars, they have just been in another world because they've been able to really stay, even just from bed, looking out the window, seeing the birds, studying the wildlife in their backyard, um, this person had wrote us and said that it had really changed his life and, and had really improved his outlook and just being in a pretty terrible, in a tough position, a challenging position to be able to kind of expand and, and not actually be outdoors, but to see and be in nature um, using a tool like ours. I think that really kind of warmed our, our hearts internally. And, um, you know, we, we are making the provisions that can be interpreted in many different ways. But when, when you have something like that, I think it really does. It is pretty warming. Um, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Let's finish with this, Chris. What is uh, any final comments or things that you'd want to share with people that are out there either thinking about binoculars or monoculars, not even thinking about them? Uh, what would you want to share kind of in conclusion about the company, about your products, about where you guys are headed? Well, I mean, to someone who's out there looking for binoculars, if, if you have a pair of binoculars at home, like start using those. I hate to say it, but like don't buy new stuff just because it's new and shiny and you saw an ad. I mean, buy it if there really is that use case that you see for for the product. Um, but yeah, start with what you have and, and get into it. And get, really, yeah, get off the couch. If you're, you're thinking about binoculars, you want to start birding, you want to start kind of 
hiking and bringing that tool with you to explore new lines. I mean, it is one of those things where even just going out camping, um, it's one of those tools that really helps you further your presence and connection with nature. Um, I like to say it's like a visual meditation, the way that you can find presence using binoculars because it filters out all the noise into just what you're looking at and being behind them. There's kind of this visual presence that, that you can find. So I think that idea of kind of mindfulness and, you know, a reminder that nature brings, um, it can help you cope with the stresses of day-to-day life. And it, and it does kind of bring that mental health benefit of just finding presence and stillness. Um, that's really what we're about. That's what we're about. Um, it's not about the bird count and obviously those things matter and we care about them. But really, I think the tip of it for us is finding that moment where you're, you're not worried about the past or the future and you're really just locked in on that present moment. So, you know, we, we make tools for that, but, uh, again, mindfulness is, I think the big, the big thing we could all use a little bit more of. Yeah. I think the fact that you have focused on making a product that allows people to connect with nature, uh, and have been consistent in the way that you do that, the way you design, the way that you package and ship and interact with your community is, is really admirable. I'm a huge fan of the brand, of your company, of you as a founder and CEO. Uh, I've been really honored to get to know you and to hear about the company. And I will be a, uh, an ambassador moving forward. I'm looking forward to getting my hands on the product. And uh, I can tell you, you know, uh, small spoiler alert, I can tell you what my father-in-law and my father will be getting for Christmas this year. So uh, <laughs> very excited to have that. So Chris, I really appreciate you coming on the show, man. You've been a great interview, really enjoyed learning about the company. And I know the audience is going to love your brand and, and what you guys stand for. I think it's, it's really admirable in today's world. Thanks, AJ. It's been a pleasure being on this podcast, listening to you. Great questions and and really cool to hear our similarities of experience um, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. That's it. All right, Chris, you are off the hook, man. Great job. Outstanding answers. You really nailed